And welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. I'm so glad you're joining us for another one of our science lessons. I hope you've been in watching these in this series because this is a fascinating series, Science in the Bible. I, I just love this series. And today, our topic is going to be talking about astronomy and the Bible. But you know, before I actually get into this, I got to tell you, um, just this morning, I heard uh, or I got a message from someone uh, uh, on the computer from, um, it was a, I believe it, I was getting texts and messaging and all these things mixed up. It was a communication, well, just that, yeah, a communication from a person who was saying, I, I believe in science and I don't believe in other things. Science is what I believe in. And science is not a God. Science is just knowledge is what it is. Um, it's not a God. If it was a God, it'd be the most morphing and changing God there is because it, it constantly science is making mis errors in, in what they say. That's why textbooks have to be replaced so often. Matter of fact, there was just on the news this morning about a publication, um, scientific publication coming out, how DNA, the structure of DNA and chromatin inside of a nucleus is not possibly the way that we've always pictured it and the way it's drawn in biology textbooks. If what they were saying in this study is true, they're going to have to redraw all the images of cells in biology books because it's not drawn correctly. So science, um, you know, I believe in science. No, I think this is more a philosophical thing than a way of people saying today, um, I believe in science and if you don't believe with me, well, I don't care, your opinion's wrong. That, that's not science. That's not the way it is. Science is always questioning things. That's the way it works. And as we're going to see, as, as we've been seeing in these lessons, science and the Bible often have disagreements on things. And as we're going to look in the field of astronomy today, we're going to see that science has many times had things and have proclaimed it for centuries, literally in some cases here, a millennia. And they were wrong the whole time taught in all major universities, all, all uh, academia throughout the world. They've taught certain facts as science, but the thing is, they found out it's wrong. Yet, what I find fascinating and, and so enjoyable is the Bible has certain things in it where science said that the Bible is wrong, but now we know the Bible is absolutely correct. And as we've said all throughout this series, you're not going to find a provable scientific error in the Bible. And today we're dealing with the science of astronomy. So in this lesson, we're going to explore what does the Bible in the field have to say about the field of astronomy? And as we look at this, we're going to look at, at certain verses and stuff and certain ideas and topics or object, objectives, if you wish, having to do with science of astronomy and, and what it has to say concerning what the Bible says. We're gonna see the two of them again. Now, again, the, the Bible is not a science textbook. I, I agree, I totally support that. The Bible is not a science textbook, but what information in different branches of science can, are contained in the Word of God, guess what? It's gonna be true because this was given to us by inspiration from a holy, perfect, almighty God. So if he says it, it's going to be real, and that's what we're going to be looking at. And this branch of science, astronomy, goes back to the earliest of human history. So as we explore this about astronomy, um, we're going to have some fun with this one because some of the theories and stuff that are there and some of the, the conflicts that have been with the Bible uh, almost come out to be humorous because how science has proclaimed things in the past. So are you ready to join me on a really cool, uh, boy, I feel like we're taking a spaceship trip into outer space or something, ooh, you know, like Star Trek or something. Woo! Uh, don't get me started on Star Trek Next Generation. I really like that show. But anyway, let's get into astronomy and see what uh, the Bible has to say about it. So first of all, how big is the universe? That's our first objective we're going to talk about. How big is the universe? And for a very long time in human history, people believed for a really long time, people believed that the universe was not that large, that it was sort of a, a small thing, actually that it was contained um, in some type of an, um, a chamber of some sort, um, but it was small in volume, always small in volume compared to the, the vast expanse of like what Star Trek shows. Here we go back to Star Trek again, I'm sorry. Uh, but starting with the ancient Egyptians, 
we go back all the way to the ancient Egyptians, and, and then we could get into the Greeks and stuff. Many thought that it was a huge sphere just a huge sphere, um, limited in its size and in its contents. That's what was taught for a long period starting back then. It wasn't until the 16th century AD that a guy by the name of Nicholas Copernicus, brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man, who had very close ties to the Catholic Church, um, and he had a very strong and very knowledgeable uh, understanding of Scripture, and he believed that Scripture was true. He wrote many things. We often have, uh, just associate Copernicus with astronomy, but oh my gosh, he, he was so brilliant in other fields, mathematics, uh, medicine, he, he even got into politics. Now there's a strange one for you, but he believed that God created the universe. Yes, that God created the universe, and he took the Bible very seriously, that if it's in the Bible, that's gonna be true. That was how Copernicus viewed things in the 16th century. His contribution to the science of astronomy are very well documented. You could go to almost any astronomy textbook or class, and you're gonna hear what Copernicus said and what he wrote, because he published quite a few things. Um, I even took, when I was in, in school, back when the earth was cooling, if you will, uh, I took a class on astronomy. With, I thought I was gonna be taking a class talking about, ooh, the different planets, ooh, the constellations, you know, what's, what's in this and everything. What it ended up being was a modified and advanced mathematics course. We spent most of the time doing mathematical uh, equations and stuff instead of sitting and talking about the composition of the sun, the composition of Jupiter and stuff. Um, we didn't get into that. We talked about ellipses and we talked about all sorts of math problems. And so I had a real vague understanding of what astronomy was. Now, Copernicus was a mathematician. And you're gonna see a lot of astronomers are mathematicians. Well, anyway, concerning the size of the universe, Copernicus knew his Bible, and he knew in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, there is a science statement that is made here um, that science said was for centuries was wrong. And they said this, um, this was wrong. What Jeremiah has written is wrong, but this is the verse. It's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 37. And it says this, and out of the English Standard Version, which is a word for word translation. So here we go, it says, thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for, they, for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Now, that's the verse. So what's this talking about? The first part here is talking about the heavens can be measured. In this verse, God is declaring, first of all, what this means is that God is declaring that he will discard his chosen people, Israel, from being his people when the heavens can be measured. It, he is, in fact, saying that he, in a way, he's saying, I'm never going to discard Israel. If you follow eschatology, even to this day, Israel, even present Israel, has a major role in this. And he knows where the ten lost tribes are, and he has everything all planned out. Everything that is happening, as screwed up as our world is, is in a plan that God has put together. And this is a promise from God, from a holy, perfect God who cannot break his promises. He says that the in this verse, he specifically states that the heavens cannot be be measured is what this says the heavens cannot be measured now at the time since this is ancient history and for many centuries man thought remember that the universe could be measured that it was a contained in a sphere so we read of a distinct contradiction now between science and the Bible which one's correct you can have and this is the thing about science you can have different views it's trying to figure out which one's correct and Scientists often change their views with more information coming in. And this is the story of a really interesting story of how this one came about that to find out that the Bible was correct with what Jeremiah wrote. You see, today, especially since we have what's called the space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, scientists no longer think that the universe is a small sphere. I mean, that has been blown out of the water now, containing just a few objects floating around in it. No. We now know it's a vast conglomerate that is beyond measure. Our galaxy also is but one of, according to the last study I read, about two trillion galaxies thus far discovered 
in the vast expanse of the universe. Uh, the Bible has always been correct. The Bible says the heavens can't be measured. And this is what we now know is truth. But for a long time, science had it wrong. Let's go to a second topic, sort of on the same, same field here. Let's get into the number of stars. This one I find quite humorous, actually. I, I, I just think this is a, a funny story about how we came up with the number of stars. Science has always been interested in the stars that fill the night skies. I mean, who of us have ever walked out in the night sky? Particularly, I live in the north woods of Wisconsin, and there's no cities anywhere around where we're at. You can go out and you can easily, on a clear night, see the Milky Way going right across the sky. It is absolutely brilliant to see this and, and easily distinguished among all the other stars out there. But standing out and looking at the stars, now if you live in a big city <laughs> with the light pollution, you're not going to be able to see too much. But up here where I live, or if you've ever been out in the ocean, I remember as a, uh, one time many, many years ago, I was on a, um, a small yacht out in the ocean in the Bahamas, and we were way out at sea. Um, we were in a, a place called the Berry Islands. And I remember sleeping on the bow of the, uh, of the boat we were on uh, one night when we were there and it was just absolutely clear. There was no clouds. And I remember laying there on the bow, just trying, you know, starting to go to sleep and looking up and thinking of the vast number of stars. And, you know, if, if you have a problem sleeping, some people will count sheep, try counting stars. Uh, boy, you're gonna be, <laughs> if you can do it, you're gonna be awake a long time. But people have often wondered how many stars are there? And it has puzzled mankind on how many stars there are. Well, let's get into the history of this. And like I say, so this is really funny. You got some really cool people with some weird names too as we go into this. First of all, the number of stars. As far as we know today, tracing back who went outside, laid down on a blanket, maybe with a bucket of chicken or a pizza, and started counting the stars in the sky. Because that's how they did it, folks. Maybe not with pizza, maybe it was Chinese food. But they laid out and they actually counted the stars. And they actually recorded this. So back in 125 BC, 125 BC, a Greek by the name of um, Hipparchus of Rhodes is the guy's name. Now Rhodes is what is today present-day Turkey. He was a very, very famous mathematician. Um, he's known, if you're into mathematics, you'll know him probably as the father of modern trigonometry. Um, but he also made many contributions, as many mathematicians did, in the field of astronomy. And he is considered by many to be the earliest, prob probably the greatest of the ancient astronomers. And he set many ideas about astronomy and about the universe that science sort of just just took it, since it came from him, uh, took it as being fact. He also made the first star catalog. He catalog, uh, cataloged all of the stars that he could see, and he mapped them all very carefully, categorized it, and they published this. Um, and so it was a book that was used as a star guide, and, which we can go to any bookstore today. You can pick up books like this. This catalog was in use. Remember, this was 125 BC. When Edmund Haley, the guy famous for Halley's Comet in the 1700s was working in astronomy, he used that exact catalog. The same catalog, which was published in 129 BC, um, and it, it listed 850 stars in the universe. 850 stars. Do you get that? That science is teaching, and they use this book, even into the 1700s, this book's being used. But they used this book to teach how many stars there were, and science was saying there's 850 stars. Well, that's where things went for a while. Um, Hipparchus' work uh, was checked later on, um, just about a oh, hundred or so years later, by another ancient astronomer whose name was uh, Claudius Ptolemy. Now, there's a lot of Ptolemies in ancient history. It's a very common name. This is the Ptolemy that lived around 140 A.D., um, he's a very famous astronomer, very famous mathematician. Here again, we're in math. Um, and he went out and studied the night skies, and he too built a star catalog. He, he said uh, Hipparchus' um, catalog was a little incomplete. He says, no, there's more than 850 stars. So Ptolemy went out, 
laid down in a blanket one night, bucket of chicken or something like that, and started counting the stars. And he came up with 1,056 stars. 1,056 stars in the universe. And so that was considered then scientific fact. Actually, Ptolemy's number was more accepted than the others uh, that came up with star catalogs throughout the, uh, the centuries into the, um, the modern era and stuff like this, the common era, because um, the 1056 just seemed a little bit more, more uh, acceptable. And so that's what was taught. You went to any major university, you would learn what Ptolemy said. There's 1056 stars. He even wrote a book on it called the Sin. Uh, Syntaxis Mathematica. And in this book, he actually placed his star catalog. Every major university used this for centuries. Centuries. And they taught it as truth. In it, students are taught for the next 1,400 years that there's 1,056 stars in the universe. That's all there were. And they taught a lot of other things incorrect in this book. But as time goes on, remember, this is 140 uh, A.D., you go about a thousand years, about a millennia, we start getting into some other scientists picking up on this and thinking something's not right with this number. Um, there was one in 1428. He was a Muslim mathematician and astronomer. His name was Ula Beg. Uh, Ula Beg, he um, built an, uh, an absolutely huge uh, observatory in uh, Samarkand, which is present day Uzbekistan. And he built this thing. The remains of it are still there to this day. And he went out and made a star catalog also. But in his star catalog, he counted that there were 1,018 stars. Because he said, I think Ptolemy probably double counted a couple of stars. I mean, try laying out some night and try and count the stars and see how difficult this is. So he said, I think he double counted some. He came up with, after testing it over and over, he came up with 1,018 stars. So... Uh, that's in the uh, 1400s. He came up with that. But not long after this, we have another person who comes along, um, not very long after, in 1598. A Danish astronomer, you probably have heard of him if you've studied anything with astronomy, uh, Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe also checked Ptolemy's work, because that's what he was taught was Ptolemy's catalog. And he too agreed. I think Ptolemy double counted some stars. So Brahe counted the stars. He made his own little thing. And he came up with 1,004 stars. Ooh, so it's a little smaller yet. So 1,004 stars are what we find in the universe. Well, uh, we go another 100 years or so. We come to Johann Kepler. Now, Kepler, we have talked about him before in some of our science things. Kepler was a Christian. Um, he believed in the literal Bible. Um, he studied in seminary. While he was in seminary, he felt the Lord actually calling him to, instead of being going into like um, the, the clergy or something or studying in theology, he felt the Lord calling him to study astronomy. So he changed fields and went into astronomy. And he recounted the stars, and he determined that there were only 1,005 visible stars in the night sky. So that's Kepler. You see, we keep coming up with different numbers here. Now, upon this general number, they, he also wrote that there's only about 1,000 or so stars that are in the universe, very small number. And this is then Kepler's idea of what he comes up with is now taught. They discard what Ptolemy said. They stay pretty much with Kepler in all universities. And so his, his star guide and his numbers and stuff are what was being used. But you know something? There's a problem here. No one caught yet. The Greeks, um, the, the ancient people, all these people we've mentioned, um, Danish people, Copernicus, Italians, et cetera, et cetera, they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. No one has gone south of the equator and counted the stars there. So all these numbers where they're saying that these are the numbers of the universe, we're not even looking from the Southern Hemisphere. You know, we've got different constellations. You go below the equator, like down under where Australia is, you have totally different constellations. None of these are even known about. So there's no knowledge of these. They've, the numbers, everything that we've come up with is only talking about the Northern Hemisphere. 
So I found that sort of interesting. I mean, if you go out into the night sky on, on the, the dark side of our planet at nighttime and you count the stars in the northern hemisphere, say you're on a ship and you count them there, then you go down below the equator and you count the stars down there just with your visible eye, you're going to actually come up with about 9,000 visible stars that you can see with your naked eye. Not using binoculars, just your naked eye. About 9,000. See, we're not even close to the number um, that science was teaching correctly at that time. But in the 1900s, 1990s in fact, I remember then when this was launched, the Hubble Space Telescope was placed in orbit around the Earth. This device changed everything in the way that we view astronomy today and having to do with galaxies and stars because scientists now know by using this device that it is impossible to count the number of stars in the universe. Now what was it that the Bible said? They can't be, co they can't be counted because the Bible says in Jeremiah, we're still back in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 22, this is out of the New American Standard Bible, which is a word for word, it says this, Jeremiah 30, 33 22, as the heavenly lights, stop here, heavenly lights is talking about stars, as the heavenly lights cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who served me. Right there in the Bible, it tells us, you're not gonna be able to count the stars. You, you can't count the stars, they're innumerable. In this verse, what this verse is actually talking about, it's a promise God is making, and he has made to David, it's called the Davidic Covenant, that the Messiah will come from David's line. Um, and in, in this, he's talking about this, which is, that's recorded, the Davidic Covenant goes back to 2 Samuel chapter 17. Um, and then God also made a covenant um, back in Numbers chapter 25 about the priesthood, and he makes these promises. Now, God can't break his promise. So God is stating that there are not exceptions to these, co uh, these covenants, and he will fulfill his part of them as certain, here's what this verse is saying. God is saying, I will fulfill my part of this covenant, of this agreement with you, as certain as the stars in heaven cannot be counted. That's what he's saying. That's what this verse is. And so God is making, taking an oath that the stars can't be counted. And that's what we see. And that's what we come up with. God is telling us, you cannot count the stars in the universe. By the way, this verse dates back 2,400 years ago. And it was taught for 2,400 years that science taught, oh, this is fact, this is the true science. The number of stars can be counted. No, the Bible has proved that uh, <laughs> science was wrong. God was correct all along on this. So with that one, let's go to a different type of thing. Since we're talking about stars, let's, let's stay with stars. Stars, different types of stars. Oh, this is fascinating too. I just love this one. You know, until just recently, scientists and academia actually taught that all stars were basically the same. There's no variations in stars. They're all alike. You might be sitting in class, well, how come that star sort of has a bluish tint and that one over there has an orange, orange tint and this one's sort of reddish? Well, they would say, well, um, it, don't worry about it because all stars are exactly alike. They're made of the same substance. You don't have to worry about it. Just put B on your test or whatever, you know. Um, there were theories out there about differing brightnesses and colors, but actually they were teaching that stars were basically all the same and of similar composition. That was science's stance on this for a long time. Where did this start with? Oh man, you gotta go back all the way to Aristotle. In between the Old and the New Testament, Aristotle, the great philosopher, the great scientist, uh, the, the tutor of Alexander the Great, around 350 BC, right in there, he stated that stars are unchanging and all the same. Now, since Aristotle said that, not many people are gonna question it. So all stars are basically the same. Uh, and they don't change, is what he was saying. Boy, do we know this is wrong today. It was in the 1500s. Now, it was 350 BC. Now we go to the 1500s AD. We go back to Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, you get also with Tycho Brahe and, and Johann Kepler. They began to change the idea of this theory, what Aristotle stated. They started to say, no, things aren't quite right here. Uh, we get to Sir William Huggins. Now he lived around, um, I believe, 1824 to about 1910. William Huggins, he was a Christian. He was a believer in the Word of God. And he discovered that stars are composed of different elements. 
elements of like on the periodic table. He found out that different stars are composed. They're not the same as what science has been saying for centuries. He said, no, science is wrong. Um, it, it doesn't fit that way. Now, he's not the only one who does this. We come across another guy, another Christian, who is a well-known scientist. His name was William Herschel. He lived in 1738 to about 1822, and he discovered binary stars. What's that mean? That there are different types of stars. And he's the first one to discover these kind of things. There's different type of stars out there. They're not all the same. And his son, John Herschel, another well-known scientist, a Christian, believes in the Bible. He published a catalog of various star clusters and, and nebula, the gas clouds that you see in space, like the famous one that we have in this hemisphere, the Orion one, which comes out in the wintertime. Oh, I love looking at that thing with filters on a telescope. It's absolutely gorgeous and there's other nebulas and he started finding these things with telescopes and saying boy we got to make a catalog of this and he does showing there's different types of stars and star clusters there, there's amazing things out there what science has been saying for centuries is wrong and we come to another one this is sort of a modern time just in the 20th century cecilia helena Payne. um she lived in 1900 to she died i think it was in 1979 she discovered and she proved beyond any doubt that stars are composed of helium and hydrogen, and she helped to build a new star catalog based on, are you ready? On the composition of what stars are made of. On their composition, meaning there's different types of stars. So we see this played over and over. Today, we know there are many types of stars. We know that they vary in many ways. Matter of fact, in many uh, geology books and astronomy books, you can find charts of different stars in, and made in charts, and they're grouped together. You have white dwarfs, you have red giants, you have um, all different types of composition. They're, they're uh, categorized by, by temperature There's, and brightness and stuff. There's all different ways of doing this. Stars are not exactly the same as what was taught. They change in size. There's changes in composition. There's changing in brightness, distance. There's a lot of ways. But what does the Bible have to say about this? What did some of these scientists read that possibly put them into this, this idea that science was wrong? Well, we go to the first century A.D., the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. It was his first letter, 1 Corinthians. And he writes, if you take a look at it and read, in chapter 15, verse 41, again, I'm going to read you this out of the English Standard Version, and he says this, quote, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. Four, here we go, you ready? For star differs from star in glory. Unquote. What's it say? There's different types of stars. Totally different than what science was saying at that time and what science said for centuries, practically a whole millennia, science had it wrong. And people say, oh, I believe in science. Science is truth. Oh my gosh, how many times science is wrong? Constantly and constantly changing. And one reason they do this is because they take out of the equation, the Bible, they take out of the equation God. Science is nature's way many times of trying to explain creation. And sometimes you just can't do it because it was done by a creator and they don't even wanna go that route many times. So the Bible was correct all along. From the time of Paul, stars differ from other stars. Um, it's often attacked by liberals today, but the thing is, you can see the truth right in there. Stars differ from stars. Let's go to another one. We're talking about the sun. The sun is a type of star. Now, this is a very interesting one. Where we'll, we'll get into some interesting things on this one. Uh, fascinating things that are more uh, contemporary. Uh, liberals many times will jump on, on this aspect. The topic here is the sun is the center of our solar system. Now, they didn't always think that. For centuries, you see, science argued the position of the sun and the position of the planets in our solar system. The, the first major scientific approach um, that was studied in academia was called the geocentric model. The geocentric model in which geo, Earth, Earth is the center of the solar system. That's what this is talking about. And also in the geocentric model, 
it was proposed that the Earth is the center of the universe. So that's this idea. Now, uh, where did we get this, and and how can it be traced back? Well, in some parts of this of this idea date back to the ancient Jews, um, and not the Bible, but uh, other writings of the Jews called the Talmud. The Talmud, this is in the Bible, but the Talmud is not God inspired. The Talmud are uh, oral laws and stuff uh, made by rabbis and put together. It's not God inspired scripture, so it's man made. But in the Talmud, it states that the Temple Mount was actually the center of the universe. So remember, this is not straight out of the Bible though. This was a a Jewish idea put in print. But it does say that the Temple Mount, which is Jerusalem, was the center of the universe. And there are many Jews that to this day still, still uh, cling to this. Anyway, the first major scientist to lay forth this idea of the Earth being the center of the universe and that the sun rotated around it and that planets rotated around it was none other than the guy we met before, Claudius Ptolemy, 140 AD. Same guy who gave us the star catalog of so many stars. Because of this, this theory is also called the Ptolemaic system. Um, the geocentric model is often called the Ptolemaic system. Um, he did correctly state something in here, though, that I find fascinating for that time period. He did state that each planet has its own orbit, which he gave the term epicycle. It has an epicycle. There is an orbit. Every planet does that. If you sit out in the night sky and you watch and you mark where the planets are, they sometimes seem to move in different positions, um, which unlike the stars, which don't seem to move that much, the planets do. And so he had to come up with something and, and trying to explain this. And as he studied it, he came up. They are in an orbit of some sort. Um, but that was in 140 AD. Now you have to go all the way back uh, or forward now to uh, 1543 and Nicholas Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus proposed a sun-centered system called the heliocentric theory. The heliocentric theory, where the sun is the center of the solar system and the planets and things move around them. Now you can see both these systems often in charts. In the Ptolemaic or the geocentric, you have the Earth being in the center. You have, I think it's Mars, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Mercury, then Venus. Uh, I think the sun is next, and then you have Mars, et cetera. Even the sun rotating just like the planets uh, in that system. But Copernicus comes up with the heliocentric, where the sun is in the middle and the planets are moving around. But there were still problems with his idea here because he thought that all planets were revolving in an absolutely perfect circles. He could see this, he could observe it, and it all made sense, but there were some problems with the mathematics that he never was able to figure out, that the planets were in perfect circles, but it didn't quite fit. But he was convinced that the planets are moving around the sun. The sun is in the center. So, and there's beautiful charts and stuff to illustrate these things. Finally, we move forward just a couple, um, uh, not even 100 years, we come to uh, Johann Kepler. Kepler working uh, with the ideas of both Galileo, Tycho Brahe, um, and, and some others, they take this heliocentric idea that the sun's the center, and, but now they come up with some of the math problems that it just doesn't fit with the, the orbits correctly. And uh, Kepler comes up that the planets aren't in circles, that the orbit is not a perfect circle, they're ellipses, which we now know today this fits. And it matched all the math the math problems that they had in trying to study the motion of the planets. Kepler's idea matched what was being observed perfectly. The planets move in ellipses. Often, by the way, if you take a look at a science textbook, particularly an elementary uh, book or middle school or something on earth science, you're going to see a lot of times they draw the heliocentric uh, uh, model with perfect circles, which is incorrect. Uh, they are ellipses. So a lot of times you'll see a science error in the, in the science textbooks on that. But anyway, um, going along on this, Kepler actually perfected this whole idea and he's the one who published it. Uh, he wrote that he was merely thinking God's thought after him. That's a quote from one of the books he wrote, thinking God's thoughts after him. That's, that was his whole plan of, of, the, of study in his life. He also wrote, 
and this is recorded in a book called Men of Science, Men of God by, by Morris. He wrote, quote, since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our own minds, but rather, above all else, of the glory of God, unquote. Now this, this is Kepler writing this, and he's taking actually from 1 Peter, when uh, P uh, Peter writes under the influence of the Holy Spirit that Christians are priests of God, he's, that's where he gets us from. So this guy is studying scripture and he's trying to proclaim and understand nature from God's perspective and give glory to God through everything. He wasn't seeking after his own thoughts, his own glory, he was trying to glorify God and his work and that's what he does. So what does the Bible now say? about this whole thing. Now that we've given you the history of it, what does the Bible say about the earth being the center of the universe or the sun being the center and stuff like this? For many people have told me that the Bible is wrong, that it teaches a geocentric theory. I don't know how many times I've had people come up to me and say, the Bible teaches an incorrect thing in science. It teaches that there is a geocentric, that the earth is the center of our solar system. Now, um, Matter of fact, just, just a year ago, I was having a discussion with two men. They came up to me and uh, they knew that I do a lot of apologetics teaching. And they came up and they said, well, we, we know that you try and claim that the Bible is uh, without any provable science errors. And I go, yeah. And he goes, one of them says, there's a serious Bible error in astronomy. And I said, really, show it to me. And they were prepared. And they said to me that it, it teach, the Bible actually teaches the geocentric theory that the sun is the center of the solar system. And I said, now, can you tell me where? And because I had a Bible with me and gave my Bible. And I said, yeah, it's in the book of Joshua. So they opened up the Joshua chapter 10 and they read verses 12 through 14. Now, I'll tell you, this is not the first time I had heard this. So um, let's just take a look at Joshua chapter 10. If you have your own Bibles and turning there, or you can follow along in the PowerPoint that we have here in our study guide. It says in Joshua 10, 12 through 14, it says, at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the days when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Josh, Joshar, that the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set about for a whole day? There has, not, there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. So they showed me that. We read it together and they said, see, the sun stood still. Thus, the sun was in motion and everything is moving around it. Um, so according to your Bible, your Bible's wrong, I said. Well, I said, well, first of all, to understand this, you got to under, <laughs> you have to first of all understand having planetary and, and star motion stopped, as the Bible says, is not something that can be explained scientifically. This is what we call a miracle. What's a miracle? Something that cannot be explained through science. So I said, and God is a God of miracles and Jesus did lots of them. So miracles do happen. We've talked about this in the past. I'm not going to go into a whole thing just on miracles. But I said, let's, let's just accept that first of all, that this could possibly be a miracle. But then I said, now, to the idea of the sun being in motion, because I said, that's what you're saying. The sun is in motion. They agreed, yeah, the sun's in motion. Um, according to this passage, the sun is, is, you know, it rises and it sets. The sun is in motion. That's what the Bible's saying. And I said, okay. Let's, let's uh, explain, let me explain a few things to you. You're saying that the sun is in motion. Uh, or you're saying that the Bible says that the sun is in motion. I said, I totally agree. And they sort of looked at me like, oh man, are you kidding me? No, matter of fact, the sun is in motion. Scientific fact, I can prove it to you because it's one star in the Milky Way galaxy, which we believe is a spiral galaxy. And the sun is actually speeding along in its course, going around at 72,000 miles per hour. No wonder we're tired and dizzy. This thing is spinning crazily. 
72,000 miles per hour, our sun is moving in the spiral of our Milky Way galaxy. Matter of fact, astronomers estimate it's going to take 2 million centuries for the sun to make one complete revolution. But the sun is on a circuit. Yes, it is moving. And I said, so God's word where he said the sun is moving, if you're telling me that the sun moves, that is correct. There's no question about it. Study any astronomy book, you're going to see that the sun is an object in motion. It is. Now, so God's word is correct here. The sun is on a circuit. Uh, going from one side to the other, yeah, it, it moves. It really does. But let's take a look at the other part. Because as, we, as I explained this to them, then they said, well, hold on, hold on. What about in the book of Psalm? Psalm 19, verse 6, tells us also something about the sun. So we looked it up. We looked at Psalm 19, verse 6, English Standard Version again, and it says this. It, and it's talking about the sun here. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the ends of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Okay. So they say, here again, it's talking about the sun rising. It moves through the, the sky to the other end. They said, there you go. You got a problem. With, you see, your Bible is totally wrong. That the sun is rising and moving through the sky and through, through our, our solar system. I said, no, 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 no. You're not reading this correctly. Now, as we already pointed out, and they did agree with me that the sun is a object in motion. It's not a stationary object. They did agree to that. But as to the saying of it rising, that's what you call a figure of speech. You know, the Bible has a lot of things, figures of speech is found in the Bible. Here's a whole book of figures of speech. And I have other commentaries and stuff uh, that talk about, here's an Old Testament commentary, a background commentary that talks many times, will mention figures of speech and stuff found in the Bible. So we do see these things. This is a figure of speech. And you know something? I told them, I bet you said the same thing sometime in the last year that the sun is in motion. Oh, no, no, no. Don't say that. I said, have you ever watched a weather forecast? You ever watch the weather at nighttime or maybe in the morning? Yeah. I said, does not the weatherman give you a time frame of when the sun rises and when it sets? You see the time? I'll actually give it to you the minute. I mean, do you think your weatherman believes that the that the earth is the center of the universe and that the sun is moving through the sky? Do you think that's what he believes when he's teaching this? When he's giving you the forecast of when the sun's going to rise and when the sun's going to set? You get into hunting season, doesn't that make a difference if you're deer hunting and stuff? You need to know when's the sun rise and sunset. Don't we see this? So I asked them, do you think your weather forecaster believes in a geocentric theory? Because what? And they, they said, okay, that's a figure of speech. And I said, you got it. The Bible also has figures of speech in the thing. Think about it. How many times a day do we refer to sunrise or sunset? I use that term all the time, but I don't believe that the, that the earth is the center of the solar system. We commonly use this phrase. Uh, this no way al al aligns us in total agreement with the geocentric theory. Uh, this verse is describing what people normally see, not what is the science behind it. It's a figure of speech. And I said, I bet you have done it too. Did you not sometime in, in your life say that the sun's rising or the sun's set? And of course they said, yeah. And I said, so, the same standard you are using to condemn the Bible, you just condemned yourself. And they said, uh, okay, I don't, never caught it like that before. And I said, figures of speech. Well, let's move to another topic. How about this one? I had a person come up to me one time <laughs> and said, um, what can you tell me about the moon with the light shining off it and what the Bible says? Well, um, I had researched this in the past and I said, well, let me first of all tell you, back in ancient Greece, Aristotle, remember him? Aristotle taught that the moon and the planets actually emitted their own light. I mean, you could look up in the night sky, you could see certain planets, they're bright, so they emit their light. You can see the moon, it emits light. To Aristotle in his time, this made perfect sense. So for hundreds of years, it was taught that the moon was a luminous object in the night sky. I mean, it's beautiful. 
very romantic. You can go out and see the full moon. You can go out and see the different crescents and stuff. And we're puzzled by it and, and just awe-inspired. And it inspires us to, to write. Or like I say, some people, it sets their hormones on fire, walking around with someone of the opposite sex of, uh, in a night sky. It, it, the full moon is very interesting. But it was Leonardo da Vinci who contradicted what Aristotle wrote. Now, da Vinci lived around 1452 to about 1519. Uh, and this is in the AD period. So we've gone over a thousand years of people saying that the moon is a luminous object. But let me just back up for a second about the da Vinci. Da Vinci was a devoted believer in God. He was devoted in his belief to Jesus Christ and to the Bible. He disagreed with Aristotle on this. According to a book that you can download or buy today, um, I might butcher this name. Um, his name, I think it's uh, pronounced Frigef Capra. And the book is called The Science of Leonardo, Inside the Mind of the Great Genius of the Renaissance. And then in this, Capra researched many of the writings of da Vinci. And one of them that he quotes in this book says this. This is Leonardo speaking on the moon. It says, quote, The moon has no light itself, but so much of it as the sun sees, it illuminates. Of that illuminosity, we see as much as faces us, unquote. So what Capra is writing here, what Leonardo actually determined, is the moon is actually reflecting the sun's light. That's what he's writing. Well, Kepler comes along after da Vinci, and Kepler actually uh, disproved this idea of Aristotle's also, that the moon and the planets are luminous objects. And remember, Kepler, too, a devoted Bible-believing Christian, um, carefully studied the Bible. And it's noted in the book of Job, there's a verse that appears that God is dealing with the heavens and his dominion. And in this chapter, this is in Job chapter 25, verse 5. I'm going to read this to you out of the New American Standard Version, which is a word-for-word -word translation. It says, Job 25, 5, if even the moon has no brightness. Now, if the moon is a luminous object, God would not have put it this way. He wouldn't have said it like that. Here we see that the moon is not being called a luminous object in the night sky. Today, we know that the moon simply is reflecting, as da Vinci said, just re simply reflecting, as the planets are, the light from the sun. And it changes its shape due to its orbit going around the earth. And that's why it sometimes has, you know, the different shapes of the moon are all determined by blocking out some of the light uh, the earth does uh, that reflects. And that's how we get the different shades. Da Vinci figured it out. Kepler uh, went more uh, further on it, explaining more about it. So the Bible was correct. The moon does not, uh, is, is not a luminous object. And by the way, the book of Job was written way before Aristotle's time. Uh, most scholars believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible itself that was written possibly between the time of Noah and Abraham, somewhere in there. This is way before um, Aristotle in 350 BC. So let's get to another topic as we're moving through this and coming to one of my favorite ones, and that's the constellations. Now, this is a fun one for me. Um, I remember back in the 1990s being with my youth group that I was doing in an, a church in northern Illinois and going out in the night sky and pointing out certain constellations. I've also, when I was teaching with a private Christian school, I did the same thing, took the students outside in the evening and we pointed out certain constellations and teaching the constellations. And I've done this in the North Woods at a Christian camp uh, with telescopes and, and things because I, I love this one. Um, I, I had a, uh, a course in navigation, so I love to, to notice the star constellations and things like this. And, and I've been lost actually in the past. One time when I was in college, I got really lost and um, on a night sky, there was no moon, but I could see the constellations. And I was in um, a forested area. I finally got to a clearing. I had no idea which way was north, south, east, and west. Um, I was so confused in the dark of the forest because it was so dark, you couldn't hardly see the trees. But we got to a clearing 
And by looking at the clearing, I could see the constellations. And I was like, okay, I know which, which direction now we have to walk to get back to where our car is parked. And uh, we started walking in that direction and just kept walking in that direction. And sure enough, we finally came to the car. I was about a mile away from it, but we got back to it. And so you can use constellations for navigation, which is what I love. But we often associate the names of the constellations with Greek mythology, do we not? I mean, think about the constellation names. You have such names in the Northern Hemisphere as Cassiopeia, or Cassiopeia if you wish, um, Pegasus, Gemini, Andromeda, Cephas, Pleiades. And if you study Greek mythology, which when I was in high school, it was required. We always had to read books on Greek mythology for some odd reason. And as studying the Greek mythologies, all these names are very common names. So a lot of people just associate the constellations came from the Greeks. Well, it's not quite right. Let me show you something fascinating. Claudius Ptolemy, here we are again, uh, in 140 um, AD, came up with the idea uh, and, and actually in his in a star catalog that he put together called the the Alm, uh, Almagest is, is the name of the star catalog. He lists the different constellations. He draws the comp constellations and he gives them Greek names. Now remember, this is a book that is used for centuries then in all academia. So we associate these names of constellations from this book written in the second century AD by Ptolemy. That's where we get this association with the Greeks to this. Because, let me prove it to you, the Greeks are not the ones who came up with the constellations. Um, I actually sat through a class with a Harvard professor of astronomy, I can't remember his name, but I logged into, a, I was given a free uh, chance to sit in a lecture uh, listening to astronomy on this, and he actually stated this in the lecture. And this is from Harvard, um, this professor, boy, I can't think of his name, but he was actually teaching that um, the constellations, and that's why I found this fascinating, because the lecture title was about the, the names of the constellations, and he was saying it's not associated with the Greeks. It actually goes back even to the Bible periods and possibly to the Hebrew, and I was like, whoa, this is cool. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. During the age of discovery, the constellations um, I'm talking about the discovery with the, the Portuguese going out, da Gama, um, Magellan, um, and all these other explorers going out in the age of discovery, uh, 1500s, 1600s, and stuff like this. They started moving to the south below the equator and they started saying, wow, there's lots of constellations here. So we start giving them names too. But they discovered they're just constellations, as we talked about already, below the equator and some above the equator, of course. Now, in, for instance, when the Dutch began sailing below the equator in the 1500s, they discovered there's totally new constellations there. And they gave them names. Some of their famous ones uh, on the southern constellations are Apis, uh, Grus, Dorado. Now, those are not necessarily Greek, but you can see that there's different names put the constellations by these explorers that were studying this. You get to the next century, um, there's a Polish astronomer who named 10 more constellations uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, he, uh, a couple of them, um, Scrutum, Lynx was another one. And, and in the 1700s, there's a French astronomer who names even more constellations. See, we keep discovering constellations and giving them names. He called um, two famous ones, Microscopium and Telescopium. How about those for names? Those aren't Greek either. Not all constellations come from the Greeks is the point I'm trying to make here. Those familiar in the Northern Hemisphere, we just often assume the Greeks named everything, but it's not true. They borrowed names from another culture. What does the Bible, though, contain about this? What does the Bible say about the constellation names? Do you know that there are actually constellations mentioned in the Bible of the Northern Hemisphere? And the Hebrew nation had these way before the Greek Empire ever existed, before the Greeks were even the Greeks. Constellations had names to them. And the same names as what you see that we use today are also found in the Bible. History dictates that it was during the dark ages of ancient Greece, that would be around the period of 1200 to 800 BC, is when the Greeks came up with their idea of their mythology. Actually, they just borrowed gods and stuff from other cultures. The Canaanites, the Egyptians gave them different names. Uh, then the Romans did the same thing. But they took their, uh, they developed their mythology, the religion, if you want to call it that, between 1200 and 800 BC. And then, 
um, and we have these names of gods, you know, Hercules, Pegasus, um, we have uh, Cephas, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, et cetera, et cetera. And they come up with these names then. And so they give these names to these constellations. That's what happened. But long before this, before 1200 BC, before the Greeks even started beginning to think about this, you have the oldest book, which we mentioned, is the book of Job. And Job, considering the oldest book ever written, dating back to the time possibly before Abraham, that would be over 2000 BC, do you know that Job mentions three constellations by name? Take a look at Job chapter 9, verse 9. You're going to be amazed at what you're going to read here if you've never studied this before. This will blow your socks off because it says, Who makes the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south? Wait a minute. We didn't even know there were constellations in the south. But yeah, how about that? How do we know this? Now remember, Job just didn't get up one day and just start writing a book. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to him and telling him to write things. But the thing is, people at the time of Job were calling these constellations certain names. One of them was called the Bear, one was called the Ryan, another one's called the Pleiades. Sound familiar? Isn't that fascinating? And that's not the only place. You go to Job chapter 38, verse 1, you're going to see another one, uh, two of these, um, these mentioned. It says, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Here again, we have Pleiades and Orion. Wait a minute. Are you catching this? This, this is so exciting. Constellations we associate with the Greeks around 800 BC. Those names existed around 2000 BC before the Greeks. And if you go to different cultures and study ancient cultures all over the world, you'll often find that they call Orion the hunter, the Big Dipper we often call the bear. And they call the Pleiades, like seven sisters, um, or seven um, people, or something like this. We have these names. How do they get these names? How did, how did all the cultures scattered all over the world come to call these things the same name? If you go over to North America, um, now remember, we're talking, this was in the Middle East, a lot of these, uh, these things were written and stuff. But in North America, the Native Americans actually called the Big Dipper, we, we kind of called it Big Dipper, they called it the bear. Many tribes called it that. They had Orion listed as the hunter. How did they do these things? See, something's not right if we just think that all these, uh, all these constellation names came from the Greeks. Something's not making sense here. The bear, Orion, and Pleiades, seemingly based on Greek mythology, no. I mean, today, yeah, so you can take the Greek thing because that was added later on by Ptolemy. But if the Greeks invented the names of the constellations based on their religion, how come then the Hebrew people had these names centuries before? There's a problem here. How could the Hebrews have these names, the same names, centuries before the Greeks ever came around? And, you know, it's just not the book of Job. Go to the book of Amos, one of the minor prophets. Amos lived around uh, 750, 760 BC. He records two constellations. Which ones? Amos chapter 5, verse 8. Look what it says. He who made the Pleiades and Orion. Here again, we have two constellations. Now, yes, this one is actually after the Greek nation has developed them. Um, this is 760 BC. So that's, that has happened. But the thing is, how did the Hebrew people get these? Why would the Hebrew be using names if they're associated with the Greeks, uh, Greek gods? They wouldn't. Something's not right here. So to answer this, this is just very close to the time of Greeks that Amos is writing this. But why does Job and Amos, why do they have this in here? What's it indicate? This is what I got from that lecture from the Harvard professor. He said the first origin of the constellations was not Greek. He flat out said that right in, in the lecture, which I already knew that because in studying the Bible, I knew it couldn't be. He said that it was even before the Hebrews or even the Egyptians. Now, the Hebrew nation started with Abraham. That's about 2000 BC. Job is before that. Almost all Bible scholars will place Job before Abraham. That fits very well with this that these constellations were actually called that 2000 BC and before that. So we're starting to see something going on here. Second point here, since the names of three constellations are mentioned in Job, a book written much earlier than the Greek religion, it's got to be assumed that these names did not originate with the Greeks. There's no way. Third, there are possible links 
to these constellations in the Hebrew teaching that used the constellations in the foretelling of the coming Messiah. There have been a couple of very interesting books written about this. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. But a fourth thing. Many cultures all over the ancient world, like I said, have similar names to the constellations that existed prior to the Greeks. What this is showing, if you haven't caught it yet, is that one time, since all these nations all over the world called these constellations, these constellation names, or a similar name to it, that these constellations having the same name, that gives evidence that the world at one time must have spoke a common language because everybody had the same names. Now, if they all spoke a common language, if everybody in the world had the same language and they called these things these different names, then all of a sudden they get scattered and they carry these names with them into their own cultures. And as later on, like with the Greeks, they put their mythology to it, but they still carry the same names. Now, is there any time in the Bible that talks about something like this possibly happening? Yes, in the book of Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel. Many scholars believe, and this is what this professor was actually, he mentioned in his lecture. Now, he didn't come flat out and say that this is the way it is, but he did say this is quite possible, that the constellation stories were all made before the Tower of Babel, when the world spoke a common language. And when people spoke this language, they all called these the same thing. Then, according to the biblical timeline, Babel, the Tower of Babel story would have taken place somewhere probably around 2000 BC, the people are scattered. As they scattered, they take the names with them. So according to the Bible, the people scattered, takes the names to the forms of different nations, takes them to new geographic locations, but they keep the names of the constellations. Isn't this fascinating? Wow. And like I say, listening to a Harvard professor talk about this just blew my mind. The story of, of the Tower of Babel goes back to Genesis 11, the first nine verses. Take a look. Uh, this is out of the English Standard again. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Move down a little bit. It says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them there over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Isn't it amazing? All civilizations at one time spoke one language. Thus, they would have had the same names of the constellations. Yet, when they get scattered, they still carried the constellation names. And it goes back even to the ancient Hebrew. Fascinating, isn't it? The constellations sort of point to the Bible's story of the Tower of Babel as being true. Isn't that interesting? I love talking about this when in the night sky and, um, and pointing out the constellations and telling them, no, nah, it's not the Greeks necessarily. Now, I, I mentioned a point, I told you I'd come back to it. During the 19th century, there was a movement started by a couple of Christian ministers who put forth a theory that before the Bible was actually all written down, um, like possibly at the time of Abraham or at the time of the Tower of Babel, uh, maybe even before the time of the Tower of Babel, that God early, before the scriptures existed, he put the constellations in the night sky, gave them names and gave them stories to prophesize the coming of the Messiah. There are a couple of different books that are written like that. Many books that are like that on the view, you don't see them as bestsellers too often, but here's one. Um, this one here was given me by a, a great uh, Bible preaching man named Truman Robertson who started Fort Wilderness and a couple of other camps. But he gave me this, uh, The Gospel in the Stars. Um, and it's by Joseph Seiss. Uh, also, I have another book, um, The Witness of the Stars by E.W. Bullinger. Both these books are basically saying the same thing. What they proclaim in them are that the constellations were given to mankind before the Tower of Babel, and it contains the story of the Messiah, how the Jews would know the Messiah. So popular books, like I say, they originated um, a while ago. They're modern books. Now, according to this theory, according to these books, Orion the hunter, uh, to the Greeks, he's called the hunter, 
represents the Messiah. The Pleiades, who to the Greek are the group of the seven sisters, in this book is the, uh, and also because this, the Pleiades occur inside, they're inside the constellation called Taurus, the bull. According to these books, Taurus represents God as a judge to the Jews and how the Messiah will judge mankind. And you have the seven stars of the Pleiades representing a group of those who are saved and not judged. Um, and they are immortal and represent those who are the redeemed of the Messiah. And so this goes on and on. There's all sorts of things. Um, for instance, Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, what we commonly call the Big Dipper, is an, not actually an animal. It's a sheepfold with a doorway, a gate, being like the tail. And that's where the lambs go in the sheep gate. And remember, Hebrews had a lot of... Um, uh, occupation with sheep and, and shepherding, the sheep go into the, that fold and the gate is closed. The tail or the handle is the gate that keeps the lambs inside. Thus, to the Jews, the Jews will find a resting place inside the flock of God. Uh, it's stories like this that go on and on. On an interesting note, just also, and it talks about this, but this is also found in some uh, astronomy books. If you take a look at that Big Dipper or the, the bear, they used to use this in ancient times as an eye test. The last two stars in the handle of the bear are called, two stars called Miser and Alcor. But it's two stars. Uh, um, the second to the last star in the handle looks, at first glance, it's one star, but it's actually two stars. They're not even close to each other. They're light years apart. Miser and Alcor. And they used to use this as an eye test. Then can you see two stars? And if you look at it carefully, you will be able to distinguish, if you have really good eyesight, 20-20 vision, you'll be able to distinguish if you stare at it there are two stars there, it's not one star. Um, by the way, the word miser means guarded or enclosed place. Alcor actually means lamb. So you see there's some of these constellation names, you can easily draw that they possibly have to do with this whole Messiah and biblical story. Now, is this true? Is this what this happens? Well, these books were written, like I say, just a little over 100 years ago. Two pastors, uh, two different pastors wrote these things. There's been some other books like this and, and ideas and stuff. But um, whether that's, that's how this is put together and stuff, um, I don't know. Another fascinating thing, though, about uh, that last one, about um, Ursa Major, the bear, if we use that to figure out where the little um, the little dipper is. If you take the part of the cup and you go straight off the end of the cup, it'll point you directly to the uh, little dipper, which pours into the big dipper. But there's something else. In this book, I talk about this, that the handle, two stars of the handle, make a straight line to another constellation called Bootis. And that is actually, according to these ideas, that's the shepherd or the Messiah. Fascinating stories. Fascinating ideas. Are they real? Is this true? Well, most Christian scholars and astronomers dismiss this. They say it's more of a modern take of the messianic story that we have from the Bible, and they've put to the constellations. In a way, sort of like what the Greeks did with the constellation names. They took the Greek, or they took the names and added the religion to the constellations. Most scholars believe that's what's happening here. It's a storyline where they take the story of the Messiah from the Gospels and they put it to the constellations. Now, um, very well, that, that possibly is the answer to that. But what I do find interesting, and I have used this, I have actually pointed people using the constellations in the night skies, telling them stories like this. I, I personally, I don't think this is, I think this is a modern take. But I have used this for evangelizing non-Christians and showing the story of the Messiah just by using the stars of the constellation. You can do that. You can, if you study these books, you can actually do the whole mess, uh, messianic uh, story of um, Jesus being the Messiah and being victorious over evil and redeeming those uh, who are lost, et cetera, et cetera, and protecting them. It's fascinating stuff, but I believe it's just like what the Greeks did with their religion and the constellations. I think these modern pastors have sort of taken this idea because I've checked as far back as I can. I cannot find any evidence going back into ancient time of the Jews having this type of a story. But we've come to the end of this study. What we've seen is the Bible does have many things having to do with the science of astronomy. And what we have found also, the Bible is absolutely correct. 
There's no contradictions. There's no errors in the Bible. When you study the biblical writings carefully, going back to the original languages and stuff, you start to see that what is in the Bible is true. Science constantly changes. Science is constantly making errors and having to correct itself. As I said at the very introduction of this thing, this is truth written by a God who over 79 times in here refers to himself as a proper name called truth. God is a God of truth. There is truth here. Science disagrees, as we've been seeing in the series. Science disagrees and will say the Bible's wrong for centuries. But what usually always comes out in the end, this is true. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this series. I've so enjoyed having you come along. We have other ones that are coming up in the series yet, and I hope you'll enjoy watching those and getting into it. And I hope you're using your Bible as you study this and make little notes and things in here too so that you can tell other people about these things. I'd love for you to share um, our website um, or our Facebook page with others. But I want to thank you so much for joining us as we've done this little series here today. And until we meet again, take care and God bless. <laughs>